Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This next gentleman who is coming up to give a keynote is a man of many contrasts. On one hand, he likes adrenaline. He owns a Ducati bike, uh, a V4 Ducati, so he flies at 200 kilometers an hour. On the other hand, he's a classical violinist, a professional one, and if you want violin classes, talk to him about it. He's also a lecturer in the university. Uh, he, did his, uh, he did a jump analysis on the Bitcoin market. So he's a man of many, many contrasts. He's here to share with you for a few minutes. His name is Adrian Tricani. I hope you'll make him feel welcome now. Enjoy. So it's a great pleasure to be here today at CV Summit to speak about this important topic that is crypto assets custody in banking. You know, I like to remember that 10 years ago, Bitcoin was invented to bypass the banking system, creating a platform that you can use to store and transfer value completely independently in a distributed way, peer-to-peer -peer way. What we see 10 years later is that last 10 years have been difficult. Many hacks, many Bitcoin stolen, many other asset class stolen, and even in the most secure locations that we assume at least they are, like exchanges. And you know, I have a little story about this. Personally, in 2013, when I started trading and arbitraging the markets with Bitcoin, I, I thought it was a very interesting business opportunity. You, know, you had these different prices on the exchanges, up to 10 persons difference. $20 one way, $15 the other way. You just sell where it's expensive and buy where it's inexpensive. The issue with that is that even though it seemed like a very profitable business opportunity, these three exchanges were Bitcoin Central, Bitcoin 24, and Empty Gox. The three of them went bankrupt and lost all of the reserves they had and basically went bankrupt with this business opportunity too. So, you know, thinking about this, it really shows that security of cryptocurrencies and digital assets is absolutely essential. And it all relates to this notion of private key. A private key is like a very long password that you use to access your funds. This is a unique access point to your funds. If you lose it, if it is destroyed, or if it is stolen, it's too late and you have no recourse to recover your assets. So this idea of being your own bank and managing this key by yourself is a great option to have, but in many contexts, you prefer relying on a trusted third party. And so this is exactly what banks are starting to do today. It's to offer this trusted platform which relies on proven technology to manage digital assets and offer the service to the end clients and also institutional clients. Now, it's not that easy because one way to do it would be to say, let's just take a piece of paper roll a dice multiple times and generate a stream of random numbers that you write on the piece of paper, you fold it, you put it underground in a big you know, safe deposit, and you say, voila, this is my storage for my cryptocurrencies. It works, and to some extent it is relatively secure. But as you can imagine, every time you want to access your funds, you need to get back to the basement, it is a lengthy, costly, and risky process, and therefore it doesn't work in every context. This is the idea of a cold storage. Now, you have the other extreme, which is let, why not having just the key in a database and it's very fast to access. You can automate a payment as soon as you want. Your client presses on the e-banking to pay. Money is gone, the money is out because you can just call the database and use this key to authorize the transaction. Well, it is indeed very liquid in this case. You can access the money very fast, but it is not very secure. And this is sad to say, but with security in general, you can't have both security and liquidity at the same time. And this is one of the biggest challenges you have as a custodian, is to find ways to mitigate that and having these different layers of security versus liquidity. So the challenge today for custodians and banks is really to be able to rely on a trusted solution. As you can imagine, my company, uh, for which I'm, a found, I'm the founder and CEO, Metaco, is specialized in this sort of solutions. And we, we work with custodians, with infrastructure providers, with core banking software providers to integrate this sort of technology in the legacy stacks uh, that banks rely on today, such that you as an end user or companies as institutional clients can consume cryptocurrencies, digital assets in a fully integrated way, exactly the same way they work today with other asset classes. What it means is you need to have the storage layer is the first one. This is what Metaco is very strong at. On top of that, you need to add compliance services, of course. You need to add liquidity services. And you, of course, want to have the complete integration into the core banking platform. 
So we have the chance today to have four great companies presenting their own solutions that solve maybe part of the solution. We also have the Custodigit uh, platform. It is a joint venture just announced with Swisscom, Deutsche Börse, and Signum uh, on stage today. And of course, this is very interesting to see what they can do with such a platform, having all of the components in one single package. So that's it for, for me now, and uh, I will be part of this panel. Hopefully, we have time for questions. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Excellent. We're going to add another chair or two, but can I please welcome onto the stage the head of technology of crypto assets in NACTA and the moderator of this panel? It's Lucas. Come on. Uh, Lucas, you've got a very strange history that got you to a very respectable job. In your early days, you got caught hacking into websites as a teenager. Uh, which is strange because you're also a badminton player. And generally, badminton players are very good g gentlemen and decent people, but you've got a dark side. Uh, what do you do nowadays uh, with crypto assets and NACTA? Tell us a little bit about your role. Um, we're doing custom software development, helping companies to integrate cryptocurrencies, developing cryptocurrencies, and consulting in that. Super. And what's this panel about? It's about um, helping financial institutions, and so mostly banks, how to store the bitcoins and other crypto assets of their clients. Okay, excellent. Well, if you're ready, can we bring the panelists up? Yeah. All right, put your hands together for the panelists, please. Okay, great. Well, let's start with an introduction round. Maybe you can just quickly say who you are and what you do. And Adrian, we already know who you are and what you do. But if Happy you want to add something. <laughs> well, I think it's clear. So I'm founder and CEO of the company Metaco. We specialize in crypto asset and digital asset custody. So Peter Hoffman, CEO of Custodigit. Philip Homo, CEO of Swiss Crypto Vault and head of storage at Bitcoin Swiss. Stein van der Straten, CEO of Crypto Storage the infrastructure provider within the crypto finance group. Okay, thanks. So, I mean, I if I don't know your business, I kind of assume you all do the same thing. So how are you different than the person next to you? How are you different than your competitors? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, no, one, one, could, one could just say that we are competitors. I would not say that. As I, you probably saw in the slide, there are many components on which you can focus. There is the hot wallet aspect, the cold storage aspect, the full stack that you, can wa that you want to build uh, beyond just storage, but with compliance liquidity. And I think uh, it's pretty fair to say that we are, to some extent, competitors, but we can even be partners on other use cases. Yeah, I think especially uh, Peter has a bit of special seat in this round because uh, it's a different layer, an integration layer, as I understand, as you manage it. While we, we provide the technology underlying it, but we also provide asset storage for ICOs or foundations, uh, private individuals who really ha want to hold their own assets uh, with us. It's exactly the case as you mentioned it. So Casta Digit is really focusing on the business process layer. So for example, how do you connect to the liquidity pools? How you do settlement in a compliant and automated manner? So at Crypto Storage, we provide the infrastructure for financial intermediaries. We also provide the layer on top connecting all these things and doing advisory on integration. But yeah, purely infrastructure provider. We are not storing ourselves for clients. Okay, and you're only mostly focused on the Swiss market, right? Well, depends. I mean, um, we also look into Asia via Singapore. Uh, we're also looking into the US and got strong demand out of the UK. And we're a Swiss company. We think it's the very best place to, to do this kind of business. But the clientele is, uh, is international from, from all over the world. And it's, it's interesting to see that even international clientele sometimes prefers to use his unit in Switzerland, you know, his, his subsidiary in Switzerland to start the business and then to extend internationally. Absolutely. To be in Switzerland is a, a big advantage we are having, I would say. But uh, for Casta Digit, as you may have heard, we uh, welcomed a new investor. So uh, we are really focusing on the international market. The interesting thing is also if, if we get an, an RFP for, let's say, a Singaporean bank or for a UK bank, um, they pit the, the RFP comes out of Singapore, but they think about setting up a company here in Switzerland and starting it up from Switzerland because um, the regulator as well as the law and the whole, whole crypto valley here is so appealing to them. 
but now you're all startups. And now I see this huge competition coming from the US, Fidelity, which has like 100 developers just doing storage. How do you want to compete with Fidelity? Well, I'd say that, first of all, Fidelity could be a customer for many of us. And, <laughs> and um, Fidelity also is not providing the technology. It's offering a custody service. Yeah. So it's really not the same layer. Um, it's a custodian that offers the storage, liquidity, the trading, and what we provide here is the infrastructure layers. Yeah, exactly, and the platform layers. And the platform layers. And we're at the stage where I think it's amazing that a company with the size, reputation, and also financial power De uh, deploys so many resources into into the topic. I think that's uh, that's great for everybody. Yeah, I mean it helps everyone. And on the other side, I mean here in Switzerland we have a great heritage, right? right? Starting small and getting it right. <laughs> Seems like a very harmonic market. And it's everybody <laughs> is kind of. <laughs> and it's also <laughs> a bit what you heard this morning on the panel. Uh, it's well, this morning they said the big banks they're like too big to get things started. I think f Fidelity proves the contrary, but they're starting bit by bit. So while we're like younger and more agile companies, we can quicker combine offerings like storage and trading and, and add services while they look at the custody, they do that. Once they get this, uh, have all the resources on that, and once they're done with that, they move on. Yeah. And also add some pressure on the competitors, which is good. With this crypto winter, we have felt a loss in demand, maybe not by the large infrastructure providers, but smaller banks. Having this confirmation coming from Fidelity is, is actually a very huge signal that the other ones have to do the same. How exactly. is the demand from the market? Is it growing? I mean, we see now uh, more and more banks announcing that they're providing custo custody and crypto solutions. Is that putting pressures on bigger banks? I mean, for now, it's mostly the smaller banks, from what I see. I don't think smaller banks are putting pressure on the larger ones. And I think, unfortunately, the announcements sometimes are 12 months early, uh, before the actual go live of these sorts of platforms. Um, however, clearly, we need to have smaller banks taking risks. We need to have large players giving credibility to this market. And this is exactly what is happening now in 2019. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's typical with infrastructure, right? We provide infrastructure, and if you look at the large in financial intermediaries, international, they put it on the landscape after the hype in 2017, Q4, so it was probably too late to allocate some budget for 18. But in 18, they started evaluating, and they definitely um, put some budget aside for 2019. And what we see now is clearly that the RFIs and RFPs are coming in to look into that topic, and this is... Um, well, everybody's talking about crypto winter, but I mean, they don't care much about prices. It's about infrastructure, going that strategy, building up a, the base layer, the, the, the concrete basically for, for the digital assets, and that's happening right now. And I would make the differentiation, uh, we talked to small banks, big banks, <coughs> international, local, private, universal bank, and I would put them in two groups. The one is the ones who really believe in crypto as an asset class, try to understand every bit of the market, how it works, how it interacts, what solutions are out there. And there's a second group which is more, somebody puts in a project team that they can say, we looked at it. And the discussions with these went slowed down uh, over the last, let's say, six to 12 months. But the other ones, uh, well, they looked at it for longer than 12 months and they see it as a market bump and they're convinced of the underlying asset class and, and keep building and I agree. It's going to be over the next month, uh, 12 months, that we're going to see uh, um, offers coming out on the market. In fact, and for us, it's uh, crypto wind is just one factor driving the demand. But what we also see as an even more important factor is the maturity of the regulation. So where you have a mature regulation in place, demand is uh, coming in. Do but we have uh, that? In Switzerland, I would say it's uh, quite stable, yes. No more open questions or? Still open questions but you have something you can work on. Yeah. And and another, another factor to take into account is uh, the existence of insurances. Um, clearly, banks don't want to, t to have this single point of failure where they store assets and they can just disappear because the key has been badly managed or there is a problem with the process or a technological problem. Until recently, it was possible to insure cold storage. It's essentially, it's a species insurance. It's like insuring gold in a, in a vault. It's something physical to do cold storage. As soon as you want to start insuring hot and warm storage, these more risky um, sort of wallets, then it gets tricky. And there are big announcements in the US. Uh, I think Gemini, BitGo announced something that they were insured, but it's always exaggerated. If you look into the numbers, yeah. you see that they just have a very small fraction of their assets which is insured. And this is changing. And we're working very hard, uh, hard on that to make sure that we can come with a platform that we know that the insurers are following because they know it, and the banks don't have them to trust just the technology. 
a word on the regulation. I think it's one thing that we have a text out there or guidance which says, to tells the bank, this is how you have to do it, but the other thing is how they implement it, because they're not going to implement it uh, themselves. They're going to use services like ours. They have to ensure that our services meet their standards, and they do that by getting uh, an audit stamp on that. Now, the auditor will provide that stamp when he has a framework or a standard he looks at, which is not existing for, for crypto. So it is a good thing it's evolving. We had our first kickoff meeting in 2017. We're probably the first ones worldwide to kick that off. And it is now, since then, a lot of that work flew into the, the auditor's work. They developed it further. And we're soon to have, I think, a, a framework which they can make their stamp upon and which gives the bank the comfort to, to, uh, to, to work on it. So it's one thing to have the wording of the regulation and the guidance, but it's the other parts of the ecosystem that also need to grow with it and develop it so it's really ready for financial institutions to offer it. That's a value we want to bring in, actually. So also on the process layer, that's actually where regulation applies. And if you can provide out-of-the-box processes in a platform implemented, it's helping to reduce this barrier and be compliant. It's, it's also a lot of common sense, right? I mean, I wouldn't expect to be everything awarded by the regulator, but if you do your homework right and, for example, stick to the best standards that apply in Switzerland a long time on, on banking standards, having your corporate governance right, um, having an, a SOC 2 or ESA 3000 report ready and, and come to FINMA with suggestions, I mean, that helps a lot, and I, it, it should be interactive, and I think FINMA is expecting that also that way. And then you progress. But just leaning back and thinking, okay, I'm waiting for the regulation, and they tell me what to do, that's not going to happen. Okay, getting a little bit into technology, what kind of crypto assets can you store, and are you open for like newer types? Do you support lightning, liquid, stuff like that? Or how difficult is it for you to add that? Well. Clearly the first step is storing it. After storing the assets, you need to find a way to transact more efficiently. Uh, we, we all know that Bitcoin is not really scalable. It maxes out at, what, 10 transactions per second, roughly. Uh, the fees can become explosive in periods of high demands. So there are technologies now being built on top of Bitcoin and the other distributed ledgers to improve on that. And this is what you're mentioning here. For instance, the Lightning Network also is about transferring Bitcoins, but in a much more efficient way, lower fees. Now, if I wanted to get more technical, uh, this network is not ready. It's clearly not ready for production. The protocol is changing every couple of months. So we are doing R&D at Metaco, for instance, to be sure we are ready when this is indeed live. But today, pushing any product about the Lightning Network would be completely premature. I mean, the Lightning Network is to, to facilitate um, a large amount of payments, but usually a small, small amount, right? A large amount in, in scale, but small amounts. And um, this is not something that financial intermediaries are looking into right now. So we have looked into it at crypto storage, um, but we don't see the demand. If the demand's there, we'll be ready. To your second question about um, liquid, yes, you know, we have looked into that. Um, this is something we can do. In general, we can add every blockchain to the system, but the market demand needs to be there. Um, we also implemented IOTA, was probably the biggest hassle until now, so the most complex um, blockchain to bring in due to the signing algorithms. But um, yes, everything can be implemented, but the market demand needs to be there. It's the same here. It's, we're a storage provider, and, uh, uh, and I think the applications you talked about is more for the payment systems. But then when it comes to adding new tokens or what we support, it's really what is the demand, what does the client want, uh, and what does the market want, and then we, we add that. As we are dealing with uh, regulated financial service providers, we have a, a demand more shifting towards private chains. So for the whole digital assets, private chains are gaining some kind of momentum at the moment. That's at least for our side, from our side where we see the demand coming in. Let's say, um, I mean, I'm storing my Bitcoin for myself, obviously I kind of have to, but let's say I want to have a multi-signature with all of you. Like, I have a key, you have a key, you have a key, you have a key, you have a key, and I'm a bank, let's assume I'm a private bank. Would that be possible? Are you, like, interruptible with, would that work? Yeah, I mean, as a general principle, multi-signature is the only way to distribute trust and to avoid a single point of failure. So I think it's fair to say that uh, all of us, or at least we do, uh, have such a feature. It's one of the main features to secure the funds. So you regulate who can access it, under what processes, and potentially even with additional constraints, regulating the policies to access the funds. 
I think that's the whole name of the game, that you have not one person or one attack vector for the private keys, but that you can distribute that, this responsibility to different persons, for example, in your organization. And in our solution, it's you get a key, we have a key, and it's only the two of us. If we interact, we can get a transaction signed. Okay, so it's in theory possible, but nobody did it yet, like this exotic way that I just have several storage providers. So. No. And with us, you can even get an approval right to the bank, so that the bank has to approve the transaction as well. I mean, for, uh, at our side, we're just looking into that, and we finished uh, a proof of concept last week where we will also allow the end client of the bank be part of the approval framework. So in general, um, you have to stick to the rules of the bank, right? They will put down the corporate governance process and, and define a framework for multisig within their organization. And we will soon allow them also to, to make security tangible so they can hand out a, a on top of the whole security architecture um, a device to the client, similar like e-banking, where they can approve every transaction of their tokens. So we just had in uh, January this hack of the, or this, this founder who died or disappeared in Canada. Do you provide something that you can prove cryptographically that the coins are actually there? Yes. Do you have uh, something like that? So first thing is, the most important point is that you don't have this single key with one single founder or CEO has having access Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. You need to remove that. Uh, and we don't know if he's dead or if he disappeared <laughs> or he just <laughs> left the company with all of the cash. Uh, there are some interesting stories about it where the money has been moving since he died and he's supposed to be the only one with the password. Um, so the general the theory is that beyond securing access to the key and securing against hacks, you, ha you have also to be disaster resilient and to have recovery scenarios if even your whole system is destroyed and you lose access to the keys that are connected in these boxes. So this is something we do, obviously, we have to do it. It's a request that, uh, that banks and, and auditors um, uh, put on us and, and this is something we provide. And I would not be surprised that everybody does it in this field. And all client assets are, in our solution, separated on different addresses on the blockchain. So you, can, you don't need to look it up in our system, you can look it up in any block explorer, see what the, what the amount is. And on the uh, audit work I mentioned earlier, it's going to be a standard that you sign a, trans a message for them to prove that you are holding the private key. Um, okay, maybe uh, one last sentence each, and then we're out of time. Starting with me. Good. No, I'm, I think it's it's very um, crucial that you do your homework not only on, on storage, but also on key creation. Adrian pointed that out a bit earlier. And also when we're talking about financial intermediaries, that the, that the governance on the signing process, who can spend what, that's crucial. These three elements are really, really crucial. Um, I'm excited. It's um, exciting yeah, times right now in the market. Time. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're still very early in the market. We came a long way. We now have 12 months uh, a system in production, heavily tested and used by one of the biggest uh, crypto brokers there is. And we're, we're looking forward and are excited to share this um, know-how and this experience with all the financial institutions that are coming into. I make it quick, so exciting times. Uh, what we see is that actually an institutional great market infrastructure is evolving and we just happy to be part of it. So that beyond technology and the capacity to secure these keys, the importance is to be able to connect it to legacy infrastructure. This is a big work. It's not finished yet, but we're working hard on it. Sounds like a promising future. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> guys, enjoy an incredible lunch networking session. I'll be out there. Let me know how I can help. And we'll see you at 1.30 here.